On this episode of Ask an Artist, we have Mary Poplin. Mary is a world-renowned visual effects artist, instructor, and maker. She's also had a huge impact throughout her instructional career, making tutorials for Boris FX and Mocha Pro. So if you've ever seen a Mocha Pro tutorial online, YouTube, their website, chances are you're probably already familiar with Mary Poplin. In this episode, we discuss the importance of being a maker. What that means is really just finding that creativity, uh, making sure that you're able to work on fun side projects and keep your brain uh, stimulated and trying new things. And it's really cool to hear Mary's unique perspective on this. So let's go ahead and jump right into this episode. Hey everybody, Luke Thompson from Action VFX here with another episode of Ask an Artist. I'm very excited about today's guest. It's Mary Poplin of Boris FX. So Mary, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, really excited to just chat with you for a little bit, kind of discuss uh, some of your background, some of your expertise in the uh, field of visual effects, but not just visual effects, um, but in the creative maker community at large. Yeah, really excited to chat about that. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Mary, the usual setup for this show is there'll be like one central question. And then out of that, we'll kind of uh, take the conversation wherever you'd like. Um, but the whole episode will center around that one theme. Uh, so the theme for this episode is going to be the importance of being a maker. Okay. Um, so I know maker can be defined a couple different ways, but one, how would you define that term uh, just for all the listeners? And then out of that, um, how important would you say that it is to be a maker? Okay. So maker is really broad, right? Because it can cover everything from content creation to physical objects to mm -hmm. being an artist. And I don't really think it matters uh, what it is that you are making so long as you are putting something out in the world to be enjoyed with your community. And that can be any community that you pick or are a part of or want to cater to. Mm -hmm. um, the second part of your question was um, how important do I think it is? I think it's extremely important. And the reason I think it's important is because it's it's even just for yourself, not not even just for your community, like let's put that aside for a second, just mm -hmm. for yourself, the ability to create things and put something out there is a battle against what I like to call a battle against entropy. And I think the battle against entropy is important just as far as your own personal, mental and personal health are. But the secondary bonus of that is as creatures that live in a community, we are all human beings in a society. Um, we want to interact with each other. And one of the ways that we can interact is to create things to share. So I'm creating something out of myself and I am putting it out there for you to enjoy. And you can either create something and add on to it or you can give me something back. And that is really magical and powerful. Mm -hmm. Man, that was a beautiful <laughs> explanation. I think that there really is something special about creating, especially when it comes from like something from nothing kind mm -hmm. of thing. And uh, Ro, our CEO, uses that this phrase a lot where he talks about, you know, the beginning of Action VFX or any other uh, endeavor he's been a part of. And it's always so cool to see whatever it is, that finished item, that finished product, and think back like, there was a time where I was sitting on my couch thinking about this thing. And at one point it was just a thought, but now it's a company that's helping people or it's a tool that is saving people time and money and all these other things. And I think there's something really special just about that whole component of being able to just create uh, something from nothing. And that is use the word magical. And I would totally agree with that. Like it's a very special thing that I think a lot of other aspects in life don't really provide that same level of fulfillment uh, which is which is really that's really something so it's for i'm sorry you're rewarded with those uh, great brain chemicals yeah <laughs> yeah that uh that sweet hit of dopamine and mm -hmm. uh any other brain magic that takes place mm -hmm. so in terms of making, uh, could you kind of share a little bit about, I mean, obviously Boris Effects, you make a lot of like content tutorials, educational uh, pieces for that. Outside of that, you do quite a bit of other making as well, don't you? I do. I feel like that is a huge can of worms to open with me. Um, <laughs> I have a, I have a, a, a 
a joke that I tell people when they're like, gosh, you, you do a lot of things. You get a lot of stuff done. You make a lot of things. I'm like, oh, thank you. That's part of my diagnosis. You know? <laughs> but, um, but really and truly, um, I am a non-neurotypical person. And, um, and that means that I uh, have a lot of special interests. And some of the uh, special interests that I have are things like gaming, but also things like creation and um, mm -hmm. even things like taxidermy and um, also things like just making creatures, which is yeah. like something I was interested in since I was a little kid. So some of the things that I have done is I have helped write a live action role playing game that I ran with my husband um, for a couple of years and we took a couple of years to write it. It's I think we put out four books. Oh my um, gosh. Uh, yeah, so that's wild. That is um, awesome. If you, if you want to check that out, we actually have passed the torch on to other people to run that game. It's called Undying. You can find it on Facebook, and it runs out of Southern California. I have yes. since moved. I was going to say, we'll also drop a link to that in the show notes and in the description if anybody wants to check that out. Oh, yeah, you can definitely do that. It's a it's a small community, um, and it's uh, they're very welcoming. And um, so that was called Undying. We also, um, I just recently moved back east. And one of the reasons I did that is so I could be closer to family and also closer to some family legacy, legacy stuff, which is a um, an old Victorian home that my family owns that I help run now. Oh, and yeah. um, it's uh, it's in a little tiny town in North Carolina, and we're slowly getting that back into shape, and we're probably going to do something with it. We don't know quite what yet. And then, um, so that involves a lot of DIY stuff, and also because I bought a property here that used to be an old family home back in the day and i purchased it and am you know reintegrating it back into the family there's a lot of maintenance work that has to be done there so i'm doing a whole lot of interior redesign and stuff like that um the other kind of stuff that i make is uh creatures i love to make creatures and dolls and weird stuff like so, out of clay or no so um sometimes out of clay but oftentimes out of parts of creatures and, yeah. and also um sometimes that are just straight cloth so i am a sewer mm -hmm. as well uh so i'll make the whole costume and a, a creature from there i'm actually working on a series of 18 inch dolls that are based on standard 18 inch doll sizes so that i don't mm -hmm. have to make their clothes but that are very um what's the word diverse um <laughs> so anything from monsters to not and uh, and i have some base uh models for that that i've been working on and then, uh, gosh, wow! I do sculpt a lot and yeah. I draw a lot. So. That's awesome. Are you wanting to build those and kind of just keep them for like a private collection? Or are you wanting to no. sell those as a set to? Yeah. So what I'm trying to do with them is I, I do want to make them myself. And I'm probably going to eventually hire some sewers to make them as well if I want to mass produce them. And I don't mm -hmm. know that I do. i got to figure it out, see what the market is. Yeah. Um, but uh, what I am going to do is allow people to take my pattern and print it out on a piece of cloth and cut and sew their own dolls based on whatever diverse characteristics they want to add to their doll. Um, mm -hmm. If they want their doll to be undead or if they want their doll to be like just a perfect little girl doll, you know, that looks like their niece, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's important as a representational tool for kids. Um, I am a mom. I have a small kid. She loves dolls. It's kind of where this project was born from. Mm -hmm. But um, but I've also put together stuff like just stuffed skeletons and stuff like that from there, yeah. which are super cute. So that that is really cool. Yeah, it's very. How, how weird would you stuff. say that you know whether it is the dolls or making content for Boris FX anywhere in between that spectrum? How would you say? that kind of ties together to like the thematic elements of being able to create. Do you think that each thing kind of exercises different parts of your creativity or that kind of brings them all together and you just develop different kind of different perspectives of how you approach each one or how, you know, what would you say about that? Well, I think at the core of who I am as a person is that I like to educate people. And I like to share with people. And part of education for me is sharing. Okay. It's a sharing of knowledge and it's a sharing of expertise and a way to make people's lives better and easier. And that is a thing that I really gravitate t towards as like a personal mission. Mm -hmm. And so when I make objects as well, a lot, a lot of the objects I make are educational. Even dolls are educational. They teach children how to interact with uh, creatures that they cannot hurt, <laughs> you know, and they get to practice life skills with them. But they also, you know, when, when they become stuff like art dolls, where we're getting more into the zombie kind of things and vampires or, you know, little, little orc dolls, mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing is less about education and more about play. But it turns out play is also very educational. And even yep. with the LARP, 
LARP is about play. And again, education is a core to play. So I feel like the through line is education and sharing. That's, that's really great. And for those of you unfamiliar with the term LARP, uh, it's just an abbreviation for live action role playing, which is extremely cool, a very creative take on interaction. And have you gotten into like any prop making in that oh, process? Yes. I know. Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I no. made a, um, a boffer loot. Um, it's, I, I'm actually the most proud of this, of anything <laughs> I've made for LARP. It's a loot. I actually ended up giving it to another bard in the game. It's an artifact now. Um, because I'm that person. Um, but, <laughs> but I made a loot out of foam that you could hit people with. The cool thing about it is, uh, so LARP is combat heavy, right? Um, or it doesn't have to be, but but boffer LARPs are. That's why they're called boffer, because you fight with these things called boffer weapons. And um, which is to say, you can hit your hit friend and you're not going to hurt your friend because you're hitting them with a foam foam object. Yeah. So I made this bowl backed, um, it's called a loot backed um, sort of uh, instrument. And... Uh, <laughs> and I put paper speakers in it and I ran a wire up the handle yes. and you could put a little USB player on it so you could play <laughs> on your buffer loot. Oh my gosh. Very dorky. Extremely dorky. I mean, I think that's killer. Like honestly, yeah. yeah. That's that's right up my alley for like nerdy projects that most people would probably shame me for. Oh yes. But I have been teased. Yeah, that's <laughs> so killer though. Because it really is just like, what's the What's the thing that I can do to just elevate this and to just take it to the next level creatively, but just in that story building process of, you know, the role playing interaction, then that contributes to that story, which is yeah. really cool how that works. Well, it was also helpful because I was playing a bard and I can sing okay. I'm not a very good singer. My husband's an incredible singer. He's actually a classically, th- classically trained, like musical yeah. theater guy who is like, in the musical theater guild, you know, like <laughs> that is not me. Um, but, uh, and I can't play an instrument to save my life. So uh, it also saved me in that I didn't have to play an instrument properly. I could just be like, ha, da, 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 da. <laughs> like, and um, exactly. And the like cool it. thing about it was that it was a cudgel, right? Cause it's a, it's, a, it's an instrument, mm-hmm. but it made a really good shield. So you could, you could really quickly turn it into a shield when you nice. needed to, and then go back to cudgeling. It was a very versatile, an excellent buffer weapon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's so cool. I got to say, yeah, there's not a lot of people that I can just kind of nerd out about like some really specific, especially LARPing stuff. Um, being from a smaller area, smaller town, like there's just not too many huge, you know, pockets of people. But it's really cool to see like with the rise of like connectivity through the Internet, Facebook groups and all of these other things. There's all these like special interest groups that have been able to kind of pick up some more traction and i think that is something that everyone should be involved in you know it's like finding those hobbies or those really specific interests that may not be the most popular you know most popular thing there's might not be you know 50 or even 100 people in those but trying to find smaller groups of people that you can continue to form those relationships with and have the same line of thinking i think it it spawns a lot more creativity and a lot more um, just go back to the community piece, right? It's that whole thing of finding like-minded people to be able to accomplish similar goals with. Uh, It's really cool. Whether that's, you know, working on VFX or outside uh, all of those same principles apply pretty uh, unifiedly. I believe so. Yeah. So one question I had for you, uh, Mary is, First up, congrats on uh, Mocha's 20-year planar tracking anniversary. That is a huge deal, especially just given how fast technology has advanced, even in the last you know, 10 years has been insane. Um, but you guys have again and again uh, just stayed on the top as far as innovating, continued to be integrated with so many different workflows, You know, whether someone's working in software A or software B, you guys probably have some type of uh, plug-in or workaround to be able to provide tools for artists working there. What are some of the things you've kind of learned in your time there spent with, whether that's just like general advice for artists or uh, maybe some best practices that you've learned that have just been really core principles that have kind of carried through, uh, again, whether that's an organization that could benefit or a specific individual like wanting to 
hone and dial in their craft a little bit? Well, I would say the things that I have learned from working for Mocha are how to think about how to design something for artists. Um, because obviously we meet weekly and we discuss um, how to make the product better for mm -hmm. not just big studios, but also individual artists and people who are prosumers, but people who are also pros, you know, and, and how to think about needs outside of the way my brain works and outside of the way that I am used to thinking. Um, one of the greatest things I think it's uh, helped me do is try to think about things from another perspective, because oftentimes um, as designers and artists, mm -hmm. um, our ego can be really wrapped up in what we do, right? And we can really uh, have our vision and, and what we want and, um, and what we think is the right way or correct way based on our experience and expect that to be universal for everybody else. Um, but what oftentimes what I will think is obvious is not, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and the way that I have discovered those things is talking to new users, people who've never touched the software before, people who have encountered challenges that I wouldn't necessarily think about or worked on projects that I wouldn't necessarily think about. And the ability to get outside your comfort zone and do those things is a really healthy thing to do. And I think if you find yourself working on the same projects um, over and over or the same type of thing over and over, my suggestion that I've learned from working with Mocha would be uh, break out of that, you know, and try to find mm -hmm. something else that challenges you and that is difficult. So, and that sounds, I mean, very trite, but it's very true. You know, you really do need to do things that are hard, you know, and yeah. when I first joined Mocha, we had just converted everything um, into Mocha Pro. They had just made Moki, Motor, Monet, and Mocha all one product. And that was called Mocha Pro. And that's when I joined the team. I actually joined the team at the release party for Mocha Pro in Los Angeles. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, and, uh, and that was my first, my first uh, experience with it. So I've been there for over 10 years. Um, so about half, you know, of the time, well, a little over half of the time that Mocha has been around. And it's been a really excellent adventure. And then a couple of years ago, Boris Effects bought us and that's been wonderful, you know, because we've been able to take the tool that we had that was already like a really powerful tool. We were able to do things like speed it up, make it a plug in, invent new technology, you know, create yeah. this whole subplanar tracking system. And all of that has been, I mean, just a whirlwind of adventure and sometimes late nights and, you know, a, a lot of challenges. <laughs> that's, that's super cool. So how long ago was it that Boris Effects? Oh, gosh, I want to say about don't quote me on this. <laughs> We're going to quote me on this because it's going to be recorded. Because I want to say <laughs> okay, it was like rough, over five rough. years ago. Okay. Have, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd honestly have to check my LinkedIn to look because uh, <laughs> time is meaningless. And also we're in the middle of COVID. So time is extra meaningless. Yeah, double, double meaningless. I, I keep telling everyone because someone asked me how long I knew, you know, a mutual friend or whatever. I was like, well, we met right before COVID. So do the do the math in, you know, a couple months, maybe. <laughs> yeah. It's like we took a gap year of knowing people and doing stuff. Yeah. But yeah. The, it's Blur's Day is what it is. It's Blur's <laughs> Day, the something. I like it. I like it. So that's, uh, I think speaking to that, like, I can't imagine that influx of resources that came through to being able to, hey, we have this vision, we have this plan, but being able to have Boris Effects come in and say, you know, we're going to bring in our team and do all these other things to kind of help make that happen. And over the few years that that's already been the case, I think we've seen a lot of the results of that fruit, which is really mm -hmm. cool. Um, and you guys are just absolutely killing it, continuing, uh, you know, even with like the power mesh types of innovation, tools and stuff like that are only going to continue to improve. And it's just been really cool to be able to partner with you guys and you know, whether that's giveaways or anything, uh, we're always really happy to to do that and be able to be a part of live streams and all of that. And like this podcast, it's super oh, fun. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I can't, I mean, I cannot take credit for the direction that we have gone as Mocha. That's going to be mostly Martin, Ross, and JP. And I'm also on that team, but like it's a, it's a team <laughs> that Boris Effects, you know, grabbed. And we've actually 
stayed a team through mm -hmm. um, through that purchase. Now you notice a lot of times when a larger company buys a smaller company that that team will be broken up and scattered to the four winds. And yeah. that just didn't happen with us. And a lot of that is due to like Ross, you know, trying to keep everybody cohesively together. And I definitely want to make sure that I shout out to how awesome they did at keeping our team together and keeping the creative um, dream team alive so that we could keep putting out this awesome product. That is that is really cool. And it always goes back to being some type of team effort. You know, it's like I always love how people are like, oh, that artist was an overnight success or whatever. And it's like, I mean, there were producers, there were managers, there were all these people doing their part to piece that puzzle together to make it happen. And yeah, we've I mean, we've been a fairly small team since we started. So we're going into I guess next year will be our sixth year. Uh, we've just celebrated our fifth year. And even in that short period of time, like day one, really early on, you know, it was just me and our CEO, Ro, trying to figure stuff out, trying to just do the best that we can to insert ourselves within the industry. Uh, you know, our first year together at NAB was, hey, we don't have a website yet, but we're gonna try to like uh, talk with people in the VFX area. And one thing that I'll never forget, and I hope that I tell him this every time I meet him, I see him again is the first time that we met Ross was at the uh, Boris FX booth. I don't even remember what year it was uh, at NAB, but it was so encouraging to meet him there and kind of say, hey, this is what we're wanting to build. We had a couple of demos on like an iPad or something, you know, that was like, here's some of the concept stuff we already shot because we were in between uh, a couple different uh, bigger shoots, but didn't have a website, didn't have any marketing, anything. And Ross's insight was just so encouraging during that, even that small interaction of when we first met that was like, I definitely see the potential in this. Uh, you know, if you guys are able to execute on this, it can really benefit because there is a need for it. Yeah. Uh, and what he didn't know was we talked to a couple other people like right before that. And a lot of people, the one right before him was really discouraging uh, just because mm. it was like, hey, there's so much fire stock footage out there. You know, like if anybody really wants new, better stuff, they'll shoot it themselves. And so it was kind of like being met with things like that back to back to back to back. And it was also really hard for us to communicate like our overall vision and our roadmap and what sets us apart from other people and all these different technical small things that would go into play. But that is one thing that I think I'll always remember and just be very grateful for is despite all of that, that one interaction that I had with Ross at the very beginning was just like, man, this dude's awesome. Like, <laughs> you know, and it didn't even have to be like, a, hey, yeah, we're totally going to partner with you and do this and this. But that's eventually what that turned into, uh, just because naturally we were able to kind of get our footing and get traction. So shout out to Ross for being awesome. Shout out to Ross for being awesome. His superpower is uh, connecting the dots and, uh, and and connecting us with other other companies that really like help us grow, you know, mm -hmm. and that's wonderful. And we can all help each other grow. And I really appreciate that. Yeah, for sure. That's what it's all about. And especially in an industry like ours, it's funny talking to family members or whoever that may be that looks and they just see like the entertainment industry and they just kind of block it into this huge thing. <laughs> yeah. And there's so many like sub segments and uh, pockets of like groups of people that do really specific things on set and they only work on set and all these just intricacies. But the visual effects industry really is small. Like if you ask yes. me, there's not a ton of studios. There's not a ton of people as far as like population, if we're just saying something like much wider and more broad, but that's why it's just another thing that's been really important for me, for our team, uh, to make sure that we are able to bring value in those interactions uh, with everybody and always giving before we get. And that's that's the whole thing uh, for us as a company. I think we share a lot of those same values um, because I've seen that you know through educational content, through uh, just all of the value that you continue to give to your users, support after releasing a new, update and everyone hits you with all these questions of what does this button do and how does this affect my new workflow and all those things uh, so i feel like you guys are always really on top of all of that and really good to answer questions before they happen um, which is always 
helpful for people? Well, I think it's because we eat our own dog food, right? Like we are <laughs> testing our software like as it's being made and uh, we're doing projects with it as it's being made and making sure that it's working the way we think it needs to work before we release it. We've actually killed projects that have not stood the taste test and, um, mm-hmm. and, and had to be retired for a minute, Yep. you know, and that's just part of it. So you got to make sure that you are growing with the market that you have. So I think that ties us back a little bit too, to the, the idea of like, what is a maker, right? And like, how does that benefit? And I think one of the main things that I find with other makers, and some of us are more scattered makers than others. Like a lot of people are more focused in their making than I am. I have like 10 different projects all going on at once. <laughs> but one of the things that I notice there is a growth mindset, right? Mm-hmm. Growth versus fixed mindset. Mm-hmm. And growth mindset is vital, vital just as a person to get to learn how to have a growth mindset Mm -hmm. so so that you're not stuck in one thing or like so that one failure doesn't set you back or so that like one idea that you you had that didn't pan out doesn't cripple you for other ideas you got to keep growing and learning and educating and one of the best ways to learn is to try to educate somebody on a subject because to do that you have to be the master of that that subject or at least a master enough to pass concepts off to another person yeah that is hugely important uh, piece of knowledge, piece of advice, because that's something that isn't just helpful in your job, (laughs) right? It's not something that's just helpful in your career. It's like, as I look to um, whether that's like, you know, family dynamics, like how can I improve uh, my relationship with my wife more? How can I always be pushing more to, as you said, be in that growth mindset and not fall into a you know, this is a really good place. We should just sit here forever. Mm-hmm. And it's like, because that is going to change. The ground is going to uh, become unsettled as it always does, because that's what time does. And I think that's always important about, I mean, very applicable in your career as an artist, as, you know, whether that's like a compositor, or effects artist, anyone trying to learn new tools, continue to push themselves and challenge their skills and abilities. But that is very applicable outside of work um, in every other dynamic I can think of in which you would interact or deal with people. Super important. Yeah. I saw a meme the other day that I really, uh, and and we're, we've reached the point where we're talking about memes, but um, memes are great. I will, I will talk about memes all day. I saw a meme the other day that I thought was really great. It just kind of punched me in the gut a little bit. It was this, uh, this um, person with like, sort of just a little bit of green leaves around them, you know, and they were like, you've changed. And they were talking to somebody who was totally blooming, you know, and that, and, and the person was like, we're supposed to, you know, yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> the answer wasn't like, yeah, of course I've changed. It was, we're supposed to change. And we yep. are, we are supposed to change. So, you know, you're supposed to grow. That was a nice, a nice little uh, slice of public consciousness that yeah. was delivered in meme form. <laughs> Memes are great about doing that, right? Mm-hmm. The uh, the hard to swallow pill, that's one that usually gets me um, mm-hmm. because they're made to hit deep, and so yeah. they usually they usually cut me pretty deep. I'm like, that yeah. is a hard to swallow pill because it's reality. <laughs> yeah, the stuff that's like, oh, to get better you have to practice. Hard to swallow pill. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, oh, I hate that one. Yuck. Yep. Yep. For sure. Awesome. So, Mary, what is next for you, your maker adventure? Uh, personally, but also for Boris FX. I know you guys have just released a big iteration of your uh, current software. Feel free to talk a little bit about that uh, as well. Sure. I mean, we so we released a lot of things in this new release. Um, I'm going to just sort of list it off real quick. You know, we had um, Apple M1 and Adobe MFR support. So we put some speed changes in there, which like that took a while to implement for our programming team, the dev mm-hmm. team, and for Martin. We had a couple of things that we added that people had asked for, like people wanted to be able to track by individual channels, like RGB channels. So we put that in there. Um, we improved the dope sheet. We really improved the insert module, which is one of my personal favorite modules. And I think it's super under, underutilized, mm-hmm. but we added power mesh to that so that you can use power mesh to drive the, uh, the insert module. And then you can do things like change around the object with a grid warp on top of that, that also animates along with your power mesh and then added blending modes and quality settings, which is pretty cool. We added a improved control for the grid system so that it doesn't quite just overwhelm you. Instead, it's a little 
a bunch of little points that you can kind of move around that like it looks like pins you know mm -hmm. which is very helpful and then we added a bunch of new exports for like silhouette and nuke like that were improved and we did a uh, mesh to nuke tracker so you can take the power mesh export and export it as a bunch of little nuke, nuke trackers at once if you like with Olympic transforms and um, even a Mystica export. So this is a really feature, feature rich and, yeah. release. And then next, <laughs> I can't talk about what our next plans are, but we are yeah. already working on them. I can't like, I can't give that away because yeah. we don't know what's gonna make it in and I can't right, commit yeah, to yeah. anything that I say, but please know that we are working on a new version already. We've already planned out um, like what the next year is gonna look like um, mm -hmm. and obviously by planned out, I mean that we know that we're going to encounter challenges and we're going to have to, you know, yep. counter those, but that we have a, a general idea of what the next tool is going to look like. And that's pretty awesome. And then I, the other thing I can say is um, if you are a Mocha user and you are watching this and you have an idea that you're like, I really want to see this in Mocha and I just, I don't know how to get through to them that I want to see this now. Well, the first way that you would get to us is talk to us about it because we can't read your minds. So if you go to our forums, you can certainly submit any user requests that you would like on our forums and we will respond to them. Not only will I respond to them because I'm on the forums all the time, but our product manager will, and that's Martin Brennan. And he's yep. awesome. And you know, he's, he's the designer of what, uh, what happens, you know, in the, in the product. So yeah, we need to make sure that we're getting that's that. That's great. And we'll also put a link to that, uh, <laughs> form for boards effects inside of the show notes as well. So feel free to check that out there. Yeah. So that's, that's, if you want to be involved in what's next, that's how to do that. And we would love to have you involved in what's next. And what about you personally making, what's the next thing on your radar for, for making something? All right, so this tiny town I live in has a community college here that teaches taxidermy. Yeah. I'm going to do that. I'm nice. Gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn how to do some taxidermy. Taxidermy, um, yeah. So it's it sounds I silly, imagine but... you would learn a lot of new things that you wouldn't learn in other disciplines. Well, yes. So, um, and I already know a lot of things about it, and I'm not going to get too into details because it can really gross people out. But <laughs> suffice to say, you, you uh, take a... Uh, What's, what's the best way to say it that isn't gross? Um, you take you take the shell of an animal, you make a <laughs> new animal um, form, and then you put the shell of the animal over that mannequin to create a lovely mannequin. And I and I'm trying to say it nicely because like there's it's not a nice process. I felt like that um, was pretty uh, elegant. Yes, um, <laughs> thank you. But uh, so one of the things we've done since we moved here is I, I mentioned I have a little daughter and she is a delight. Um, she is a princess, but she's a goblin princess for sure. <laughs> and um, and uh, anyway, we have collected bugs since we've moved here that we found. Um, and I have I have acreage now, mm -hmm. so which is wild because I moved from a place where you could, you know, measure my lot in square feet. Yeah. Um, but I have acreage now, so we we find all kinds of stuff. You know, so we found like praying mantis nests that have been expended, and things like you know butterflies that a dragonfly murdered, and um, all these kind of things. And uh, and we so put cool. them in a little box. And we saved them for a couple of months until we had enough, and then we made this little diorama of mm -hmm. it's like a little cloche, you know, of bugs. And then the other day, my kid found um, her first fatality of a warm-blooded creature in the yard. Um, and she was like, so now we get to keep this, right? Like we do the bug collection. And I was like, well, that's a we great could. question. Yeah, like we could, I was like, it's pretty gruesome, you know? And she was like, it's definitely horrible, but let's do it. And, um, so we did, she actually, you know, I, I, I didn't show her the whole process cause she's very young. So I showed her the finished product and she was yeah. like, this is awesome, but also absolutely horrible is what she said. <laughs> and I was like, oh yes, it's absolutely horrible. She's like, but I love it. I'm like, okay, great. So it's cool. And so yeah, there's always that. such a healthy level of like curiosity too, mm -hmm. right? Because that goes into science, you know, how mm -hmm. our creatures designed, how they've been created to operate in certain ways. And I think there's a lot of really fascinating stuff about that, that uh, as I said, you could learn through some, you'll probably learn a ton uh, that you never would have learned in any other medium, if you will. So. Well, yeah, it's really awesome because it involves a lot of stuff that I already do. Like I already make creatures out of clay and with Sculpey and with epoxy and with all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff. Um, I already know how to sew, which is a necessary skill for taxidermy. And uh, I already know how to create leather um which is something that i've done before and um and so it's just a combining of all of these things together and um you know in general you don't have to do as much to the hide so it's actually in some ways easier than mm -hmm. tanning 
and this creature that she wanted to preserve, we did preserve it, by the way, um, was about this long. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever tried to peel something that small, but uh, delicate I can't work. say that I have. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. That's now, hilarious. I'm going to get all these nasty like comments about, like, you know, I'm murdering animals, except for I didn't, you know. The, yeah, they're, like, they're already dead. Yeah, it's, it was you're preserving them for educational purposes. Yes, exactly. And um, I, I showed it's funny because I showed my grandfather because he's my last living grandparent still alive and he's 90 in mm -hmm. a, a week. Oh, and wow. um, anyway, he looked at it and he's very proper. He's a very proper Southern gentleman, you know, and he was like, oh, my. Well, that's very educational. <laughs> <laughs> that's, <great. laughs> that's supportive. Thank you. That's hilarious. Yeah. I wonder... We should do some type of action VFX collaboration where maybe for Ross's next birthday. So like mm -hmm. next September, because we got some time, uh, we deliver him a full size moose or caribou. Oh, yeah. Uh, that has been completely um, taxidermied. I oh, think yeah. he would appreciate that. Oh, yeah. I think he'd put it right in his office. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he's yeah he he would appreciate that because sure. he knows how much love and uh, time went into that. Yeah, I think my next pro project is really literally, and I'm not joking, going to be a unicorn. I think I'm going to make a unicorn. Do it. Yeah, that's be killer. Awesome. Yeah, do it. Awesome, Mary. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Ask an Artist. Uh, just as we kind of close here, where can people find out more about you? Uh, whether that's Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. Yelp. I don't know. Just <laughs> and um, and then Boris effects on the on the end of that. Well, I have a MaryPoplin.com if you want to know more about me, and it has links to all my social there. Um, I don't really friend people on Facebook because that's like my personal view into my uh, very twisted brainscape. So um, Twitter's good. Uh, LinkedIn is good. If you want to know me as a pre professional person, I don't tend to friend people that I haven't met in person on Facebook mm -hmm. um, just because, you know, existing as a woman on the Internet is rough. Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, you can find my videos on YouTube as well. Um, now, if you want to find Boris Effect stuff, and you're not tired of hearing my voice, um, go to BorisEffects.com and then under the download section, um, we have, uh, I'm not, not download section, the support section, we have a whole bunch of training. I mean, tons of training. Um, I just recently did a whole training series at the beginning of the year with Ben Brownlee, who is awesome. So, and it's totally different training styles because he's very dry and sounds like he's narrating a nature show. He's got an incredible voice and <laughs> I tend to be about this all the time. And, um, and so we did those together and we, we go over the basics all the way down to tricky stuff. Um, we actually have a whole uh, section called what happens when it all goes wrong. So I think you might really enjoy those. And that's at BorisEffects.com. And uh, yeah, please yeah, visit that it. Is, that is perfect. I need a segment for my life titled what happens when it all goes wrong. <laughs> yeah. Don't we all? Yeah. 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 For real. I can tell you what to do when it all goes wrong. You want to know the, the four things you do when it all goes wrong? What's that? Have you eaten? Have you drank enough water? Have you gotten enough sleep? Do you need to use the bathroom? That's a pretty solid checklist. We'll <laughs> That's also your put mom that in checklist. The show <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So all these links that uh, Mary mentioned here at the end and throughout the episode can be found in the show notes. Uh, so if you're on, depending on what platform you're on, you can either find it in the description of the video or the show notes included of the episode. Um, Mary, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Ask an Artist. I know uh, we've been having a lot of artists requesting to have you on just because of your renowned mocha training. It's hilarious the extent of people that are just learning mocha for the first time. And they're like, yeah, I've, you know, been learning this one curriculum. It seems like you're always the common thread, which is always the funny thing that it gets back to of like, you have so ingrained yourself and are so equipping and giving in your knowledge that that just really shows through oh, the artists that we have here. It's, I mean, every single one of them has learned from your tutorials, whether that's when they were starting out or as you said, more of those advanced, like tricky uh, tweaks or whatever uh, workarounds to certain things. You have been immensely helpful to our team at Action VFX, but I know outside of that, I mean, countless feature films, episodic series, any other form of video content. Um, we really appreciate your giving spirit 
And once again, thanks so much for joining us for this episode, Mary. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me. I uh, I hope you enjoyed the weird glimpse into who I am outside of Mocha. I love it. I love it. It's exactly what we wanted. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Appreciate it. Have a good day.